Well, hello, John Finley. Well, hello, James B. <laughs> nice to see you, my friend. Uh, nice to see you as I stare at the camera instead of you so that I don't look like I'm looking down. Right. This is kind of like a radio interview. If We're, we're going to tell people how sausages are made here. By looking at the camera, it feels like I'm looking at you. But of course, when I'm looking at you, I'll be down around there. That's right. Yeah. So a little, a little of this and a little of that. I'll go back, make sure I know who I'm talking to. John behind Finley, the scenes, folks. you have some cool stuff behind you on that wall in your office. Now, I know you've moved back to Canada from LA. You've recorded this amazing record, Soul Singer, with Lou Pomonti and some amazing musicians. What is that record behind you? It looks like a gold or a silver, whatever that, is, that it, record on your wall. It is a gold record. It's uh, one of my gold records. Uh, it's for Let Me Serenade You with Three Dog Night. And it was a hit single, and it was on, on the hit album Cyan uh, back in the day. Uh, I was watching some of your stuff with Lupa Monti talking about the making of the record. And one of the stories I really loved is like Ray Charles also loved that song, but Three Dog Night had such a big hit with it that most people didn't want to touch it for a while. They're like, that's already a big hit. We're not going to do another version of that. Yeah, well, they, they put an exclusive, you know, it, first time recording. Um, though the song was recorded previously, but we renamed it and recopyrighted it. Warner Brothers Music did, and so that we could have an exclusive. And yep. uh, so it was a matter of who was going to give us the exclusive first. And Three Dog gave it to us first, so yep. there they went. Well, what a big hit that song was. And uh, then you spent so much time in LA um, writing songs for years and years, was it ever, was it ever, um, did it ever feel like you were like trapped in a job or was it always, were you always grateful for being creative? No, I never felt trapped. Uh, it's anything musical has always been a joy to me. Um, the business, uh, you know, <laughs> right. but the actual art, it's just, it, I'm a lucky guy to get to do this stuff, you know? And you're back in Canada now. What I love about this new record is you have songs that you've written many, many years ago and probably bought a house or two from it. But then you also have songs you wrote like a few months ago. The, yeah. the song with Danny Weiss is so cool, uh, Money Love. Mm -hmm. So you're still writing songs like on a regular basis, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the muse, uh, when the muse decides she's had enough of me, you know, then I'll, then they can put me in my grave. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back to the beginning. You're, you're in a band in, on Young Street, and a lot of people uh, uh, older than me have told me they knew the band. Mm -hmm. uh, the proof is in this documentary I've seen about how famous you guys were. John Lee and the Checkmates. John uh, and Lee and the Checkmates. John and Lee and yeah. the Checkmates. And so you and Lee were singing really good harmonies. And then this band, it really felt like, well, it looks, it doesn't look real to me. It looks surreal. When I see footage of you guys, the power and the craziness and the go-go dancers on Young Street, <laughs> people think, young people think they invented cool. But if, if I was back in those days, that looked really, really cool. What it, was it like with John Lee, John and Lee and the Checkmates? It was so much fun. And the fans, our followers, there was no, uh, it wasn't, uh, what would you say? Not, uh, well, it was, there was an innocence and a purity. Um, they, I don't know what they felt inside. I know what they exuded. And it seemed, it was really emotional. It was screaming uh, like the yeah. Beatles, John. It, it actually, watching yeah. the audience, watching the riot at City Hall, it wasn't a mean riot. It was a friendly crowd that was pushing each other around out of excitement. It was going nuts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was just going nuts. Like yeah. lost in the fervor, just everybody lost in the moment, girls screaming, everyone dancing like mm, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then something, what made you, something made you go, I'm going to go to the U.S. and join a U.S. Okay, well, here's what happened. Paul, Paul Rothschild, who was 
at the point when I met him, he was producing uh, Michael Bloomfield. Uh, what was that? A group they had, uh, the Chicago Blues Group, um, mm -hmm. Blues Band. He was producing them for Electra, and he was scouting around. And he came and saw us, came up to Toronto to see people. And uh, I got to know him. He liked the group. They made us an offer. We didn't go for it. He never forgot us. I never forgot him. And then there came a time when he was uh, putting together a group for Electra, kind of a the concept was super group. And it was get the best people you could find from everywhere. And uh, I think about a total of 50 or 60 people went through the tryouts. Crazy. I was in the second wave. And uh, so that's how I ended up really become, I mean, the Czech Mids had played in, in, in the US and in Philly, in New York, um, Ohio, but this was really, I was transplanting. Right, this is an American group with some Canadian band members. Exactly. And a, a bunch of American band members. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. So who else was in the original, uh, who was in the original version of our rhinoceros when you first started? Um, I have the rhinoceros, rhinoceros vinyl, by the way. Yeah, the, the first, ah, uh, the first album is the original membership. And that is Alan Gerber, uh, I would guess second lead vocalist, primary songwriter, and a bit of and and a little bit of keyboards. Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Mundy on drums from the Mothers of Invention. Right. Uh, Jerry Penrod and Danny Weiss from Iron Butterfly. Danny on guitar and Jerry on bass. Uh, Doug Hastings uh, from Seattle from a group called Daily Flash uh, on guitar, second guitar or you know and uh, Michael Fonfera from the Checkmates and. I got a little story about him. Um, anyway, he was not going to be in the group, but he was in Electric Flag. Uh, ah, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. That was the, the band from right. Chicago. I was trying to remember. Yeah. So he was in Electric Flag, which was an outgrowth of, the, of, uh, of some of the Butterfield people, Buddy Miles on drums. And uh, uh, something happened uh, that I won't go into, but... Uh, he ended up hanging out with us. And then, you know, there was just a nice musical meeting. And uh, so he he ended up in the group. When so you he say something you're not going to talk about, was it like crazy drugs? drugs. I, just, I mean, 60s, right? <laughs> he got busted and their management didn't said, ah, oh, you're trouble. And, right. you're, and, you're not, and you're not a citizen of the U.S. Goodbye. Right. Yeah. But it was our good fortune. Yes, because then, then Mike got it. I remember right. meeting Mike Fonfera. I've, I've seen him recently, actually, but um, he was playing with a lot of groups after that, too. Like, like oh, yeah. Like, like you just kind of meet oh, a ton was, of people and just keep working. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he was with um, Alice Cooper. He was with Lou Reed. Yeah. Uh, he was with David Clayton Thomas at one point. Yeah. Uh, so, so you, yeah. and you guys still are friends. Like a lot of these people, you probably don't see a lot, but when you do, it's probably feels pretty good, right? Well, Danny and I, of course, we're in touch a lot. Yeah. And if not for COVID, we'd be seeing each other a lot. I visited up to his home. We we've done writing together. We've done a lot of writing together in the last five, ten years. Let me ask you about Danny. Now, was he originally a U.S. citizen, or was he a Canadian? Yes, he is. He's okay. born in Sandy. He was born in El Cajon. I thought Cal so Southern because California. of Iron Butterfly. I figured he probably mm -hmm. wasn't born here. But he's yeah. living in Canada. Yeah. His, his, I haven't been to his house, but I've seen it. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, I th I'm so happy for both of you. You know, when I find guys that, I, that still play great music, they never, ever stop. But they've had a few hits in the past. But you can still live so well, living in Canada, having being a bit in nature. Mm-hmm. Gotta mm -hmm. be, especially these days. I bet you you're glad you're not in a condo. Uh, I, I, I love it. I love it. I'm just enjoying myself so much here and uh, happy to be here. 
and it's a it's a sweet and gentle country. Yeah. And uh, there's support for the arts here, and uh, and there's a lot going on musically, and uh, yeah, sure. you know it's 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 a lovely country. So now you're an Iron Butterfly. You guys are getting world famous. You're playing festivals everywhere. Um, what what was the decision for you to go? Okay, think I got to move on from this. Uh, you're talking about rhinoceros. Um, oh, sorry, rhinoceros. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know the the group. Paul Rothschild started the group. And so in a sense, he was the leader. And a lot of people in the group weren't enamored with his, with his bedside manner. And so he ended up not producing the second album. And uh, you take the leader away and the stability in the group goes bloop. Yep. And so we started changing members. People started leaving. We started saying goodbye to people. and. Uh, so uh, by the time uh, after the third album came out, um, it really, things had really changed. Right, it wasn't, it, it wasn't so much songs uh, by the third album, right? It was more like really interesting, almost jam sessions. It was like longer pieces, but not as much song. No, I- Or was it uh, after actually, that? No, uh, the third album was, was written a lot by the producer as opposed to the band mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and new people coming in. So the character had really changed and uh, there were only a couple of original, original members left in the band, two or three. So anyway, as, as all things, as all things, all bands come to an end, except yeah. for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and uh, the only, you know, they'll come to an end in the cemetery. So, um, so it was in the fall of uh, 71. That was the end of the band. And uh, I came back up here. I spent about a year, year and a half here, uh, 71, 72. But I wanted to go back to LA. And Paul and I were in touch. And, um, uh, so I, I went back in the fall of 72 and I just stayed there. Now, when you got back, uh, when you got to LA, <clears throat> when, I love this story, I've heard it once before, of you uh, singing in the church. You, you kind of found your way back into gospel music, which you liked uh, as a kid. I always loved gospel. And to me, it was, it was, the, it was the core. And uh, so I was doing something, part of a, a large investment that Stax Records made doing a live album for Eric Mercury mm -hmm. at the Houston Astrodome. And there was like a full string section, a full horn section, a 20 voice choir, a, a five piece rhythm section. And uh, so I was in that choir uh, and I, I ended up in it because as a lot of, uh, a lot of Eric's friends ended up in it mm -hmm. and I had known Eric for many, many years. So, um, in it was the director of the choir that I ended up working with mm -hmm. the voices of inspiration. His name was Alexander Hamilton. He directed the Southern California community choir, which was James Cleveland's choir on the Amazing Grace Aretha Franklin album. Mm. And uh, so, and he was really connected. We did studio work for Beach Boys and, and, and a lot of other people. Uh, Michael McDonald. Anyway. Uh, my favorite. So, <laughs> yeah, I can't sing like him, but he's my favorite. Uh, in that, in that uh, time, um, the choir was really getting around and and we started, you know, and, and I just, when I joined the choir, this was mid seventies, um, I had kind of lost my passion and getting back into the choir, it was like, I didn't know why I lost my passion. I thought maybe it was because I wasn't a kid anymore. And the, the glow goes away in life or something like that. Uh, yeah, but no, well, my friend. That wasn't, <laughs> and that wasn't the case. And no. we know that. Yeah. Um, 
but um, so so uh, um, it was all came flooding back. All that feeling that I felt in the checkmates that yeah. that just you know, and uh, so uh, we and it was a very interesting experience because here I am, this little white boy, and uh, so what we would do. In, in, in gospel a lot, there's, there's an A and B selection when you're on a concert with other acts. So the A selection would be we do hallelujah. And, uh, you know, the handle, hallelujah. Oh, yes, not the and Leonard Cohen. Did. That came later, right. No, <laughs> but we do it totally, totally syncopated. Mm -hmm. But it would, everybody else would be doing this straight ahead gospel thing. We do that and it would blow people's minds. And then after that, the little white boy would walk out front. And, you know, <laughs> so it was, it was, it was really, oh, so well, I amazing. I see you blowing minds when people, this, John, this happens to you right now. I have had people guess when they hear your voice. Mm -hmm. I have heard every kind of guess and they're all wrong. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> thinks that it's going to be you singing. Um, I would say, maybe 70 80 percent of the people when i play your song they would say well yeah. that's obviously someone black and i am going to guess around 35. Oh. <laughs> i'm like no one person yes. thought you were a woman one person thought you were a kid like it was amazing and because your voice that's somehow nice. has such natural gospel like it's in you but also your voice i i forget this because i'm a fan of yours but when if you just only listen to it how do you keep uh, control of your voice and keep care of your voice? Because I can tell people you're 75 and how do you keep your voice in shape like this? I lost my voice in the mid nineties and I went to an ENT specialist, that's ear, nose and throat. Mm -hmm. And uh, he scoped and saw that my cords were all stretched and they wouldn't work properly. He was going to do laser on me, but instead he said, let me send you to, she's the only speech pathologist in LA that deals strictly with professional singers. And she, over the course of oh, three months, a got my voice. speech pathologist? Yeah. It's, wow, that's an interesting person to send you to. Yeah, yeah. and she, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that I, you know. The rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane? Not that, beyond uh, that. Kind of, but she had me do these exercises and I was doing them like 20 minutes, six times, seven, eight times a day. And uh, gradually over three months, at, by the end of three months, she said, okay, you can sing now. And from there on, my voice got, I got all my range back that I had when I was 20 years old. And uh, her name was Bobby Banks Salkowitz, and she was a miracle. Well, yeah, because you have been singing. And the thing is, I mean, even just one song, you, you, do su you have such a range. Like doing an entire night or making an entire album, man, it's, it's, it's just amazing. Oh, by the way, right now, I love the lighting. You have some God rays coming in through your window. <laughs> I just <laughs> saw that. Ooh, as we're yeah. talking about gospel. So, <laughs> so then you're, you're writing songs, you're doing gospel, you're living in LA. Yeah. Uh, you come up to Toronto for a kind of a, a reunion, a bit of a benefit concert. And then I think you meet a woman who convinces you to change your uh, life a bit, right? Well, yes. Uh, checkmates, a little reunion. We're doing an A and B selection. And uh, it was Let Me Serenade You and the Eddie Floyd Raise Your Hand. And I just, I just did church yeah. on that audience. You know, they just gave them what I had to give. And uh, she was in the audience. And she said she saw blue light all around me. And she came to introduce herself to me afterwards, uh, or a bunch of people I was talking with. And when we shook hands, I heard this voice say, uh, and literally inside me, I heard this voice say, do not let go. This is your life. <laughs> and uh, 
three days later, we were together, and that was it. Wow. Amazing. So, she and got me coming up to Toronto more. I was by, I started spending almost half my time up here. And, and uh, finally, it, it, was, it became, well, okay, where am I going to live here? Uh, because I'm either doing a half-ass job in Toronto or doing a half-ass job in L.A. Well, this woman is not going to leave because she, at that point she still had kids that were in her teens. So I was, hey, you know, who's going to hold me in the night if I have a bad dream? The city of L.A. or this beautiful woman? <laughs> I made the right choice. You sure did. And it led to all kinds of other miracles when we met. Uh, right. When I was sitting in with uh, with Lou, and uh, at the, the old mill, and uh, I was on a jazz safari. I had yeah. twenty four people with me. We walked into the old mill bar, and I thought it was going to be Lou in a trio, which is plenty soulful jazz already. But yeah. then I saw you standing there, singing in an amazing suit and really fine shoes. Um, <laughs> And I just walked in and I, and you, you know what happens is I go out so often for so many years. When I see someone I don't know, I just, like, I'm, I'm just, I almost want to run home and eat humble pie because I keep <laughs> thinking I know the scene, but I keep being blown away by people I don't know yet. So anyone who says I know everybody, it's just a big fat liar. <laughs> like, yeah, I, no one does. So I walked in and you were singing, um, save, save your love for me. Your love for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that wonderful uh, a Buddy Johnson tune that Nancy Wilson did with Cannonball Adderley. And I've always loved that tune. And uh, yeah, it, it lifts me always. And I just remember going up to you. Uh, we, we were on our way out. It was, it was after the set and I walked up and I introduced myself to you and really said, uh, please tell me you live in Toronto. I have some shows in mind for you, like right away. Yeah, and, and you know what? It wasn't long before that that I had that we had that I had made that decision to make the move and come up. And uh, you know, I got to say, James, too. I mean, you looked at my shoes; I looked at yours. <laughs> right away, I knew. <laughs> hey, right. this is a, a kindred spirit here. Well, mine were like uh, I think they were like paisley leather or crocodile fake uh, uh, shoes from New Orleans. <laughs> And uh, we both basically looked a little bit like pimps, but 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 kind of yeah. pimps, like. uh, as they say, all pimped out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was a really great time. And also, not uh, coincidentally, you're at one of my parties when Lorenzo from Vesuvius Music sees you. Oh uh, yeah, and, and punches me on the shoulder. Well, taps me on the shoulder. Uh, he's strong, so it felt like a punch. But he taps me on the shoulder. And he goes that guy needs to be recorded does how many records does he have where's his records i need to know more about this guy <laughs> and that's right away after one song he said i'm gonna make a record with that guy and then your decision uh -huh. immediately was to go back to lou pamonti who was a friend of yours and how we met yeah. and yeah. so everything kind of came full full circle lorenzo's just, my buddy yeah. lou's your buddy we all hang out together and go let's go yeah you couldn't write a book better than that yeah, you know? and it felt like really fast. Like it wasn't fast. It yeah. took over a year to make the record, but the the enthusiasm, right? Yeah. Another fan of yours, Wayne Annika. Same thing. He saw you. Oh and yeah. That guy needs a record. He jumped on immediately. So there's something really exciting about um, because the music industry is so weird. There's something really great about just having actual fan base and actually having people jump in and want to get involved in something mm -hmm. it, right it's it's a much different family and a much different business than when you got those uh, uh gold records behind you yeah yeah that's <laughs> that's the biz biz yeah and this is family biz it's it's so it's it's so personal right everybody is excited when something goes well like your videos if you have folks i'm going to talk to the audience now hello uh, yeah. if, if people haven't seen your youtube channel the john finley youtube channel those those songs at uh canterbury sound unbelievable 
unbelievable live band and you're playing with musicians on that that aren't on your album a couple of them are danny weiss and, and lou popeye but you're playing with some people uh that you really didn't know it was it was remarkable what was it like recording with rich brown isaiah gibbons alexander brown oh joel Byzantine. Was, like that it was, was it was so much fun so much fun you know uh it, watching these songs come to life in a real setting, you know, in a live setting. It's so different than the studio. Uh, and it's, it's seat not, of the pants too, right? It's, it's not really, huh? there's, there's a danger almost. That you're at seat oh, of yeah. the pants. You've got parts and you just let her rip. Well, that's the, that's the excitement of doing live, you know, and the studio, not, not to take anything away from the studio because the experiences I had with Lou in the studio were so real. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was, you know, there was no, I'm in the studio. Um, right, right. There was no taxi meter going. going. You weren't going, you were, you were working at your own rate and you weren't thinking about the business. You were only thinking about the song. Right. There was no clock. There's no, uh, we got to get this, you know, yeah. hey, if it don't happen today, it happens another day. That's that, that is the luxury. Uh, two things: you had a really decent budget, and you got Lou Pomonti, yeah. who will give yeah. his all once he signs on to something. Yeah, you know whether it's Michael Bublé or Sharon Jones. Once he get or Lou, once he gets into something, he's full on. That's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Lou, Lou gives it all. You know the footage again on, on your YouTube channel of you, you and Lou talking about the record. Yeah. It's, it's like a master class. Not everybody needs to know everything, but anybody who hears that record and goes, I wonder why he picked that song, or I wonder what he was thinking when he wrote that, or what is that sound, or why did they modulate? There's so many questions that would go through a musician's head uh, listening to this, that I think it's fantastic that you guys sat down and just explained the process of making that record. Yeah, it's like TED Talks music. <laughs> right, exactly. You know? Exactly. Now, yeah. what do you have, uh, uh, what wishes do you have for people for the new year? I mean, this has been maybe maybe a little easier on you being in the country, not being in a city. Because I, I tell you, people that live in apartments and are afraid to use their own elevator, oh. it's pretty sad. Oh, uh, man. But what are your wishes for the new year? What do you see as potentially happening in 2021? Uh, for you, for me, for the world. Um, Let's say for you, for starters. For me, well, I hope that by the summer, um, enough people are inoculated and it's working, that we can be out doing things and that, uh, you know, I get the opportunity to connect with, the, with audiences, right. with humanity. Yeah. Yeah, with, with, with the art. With that's the a beautiful thought because that's not just mm -hmm. for you. That's for absolutely everyone. That's for me, oh, yeah. that's for everyone. I remember seeing you at Markham Jazz Festival. I think it's the first time I ever saw you at a festival with a, with a larger audience, like bigger than a nightclub. And people were crying. Uh, you were doing a blues song and you'd look around and everybody was so affected. Uh, mm -hmm. The only person not crying, I saw he had goosebumps, was Lorenzo, and it's because he was looking around going, I backed the right horse. This guy's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but but that audience, uh, I mean, even the uh, volunteers at Markham said, this is one of the best shows we've ever had here. Why, you know? Oh, man. It was fantastic. So I agree with you. I hope you're able to get out there. Um, nowadays, with not so many people uh, either believing or wanting to go to church or whatever all that means, the sense of community at your concerts and the gospel churchy in you, it comes out. And it doesn't matter what people believe in, what they think, it's the music will just wash over a big crowd of people. Yeah, that's something else. Music is such a, a, a such a, a gift to humanity, you know? Uh, we are so fortunate to have that. It's a, it's like, um, if I was still a Catholic, I grew up Catholic. I call it a sacrament. <laughs> right, you know? right. It's, it's, you know, there's this, there's this tabernacle. It, it's, it's our hearts. Yeah, right, and right. We, it lives inside us, this joy 
And those of us who are gifted and charged with music, we are charged with the task of, we, can, we got a little key called music. We can open that door to that tabernacle. Yep. And, in, and out comes the joy yep. in everyone's hearts. Yep. And if you sing in French, you can say tabernacle. Tabernacle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a North Bay thing from my childhood. You know, my dad's a born yeah. again atheist and my mom believed in uh, unicorns and leprechauns. So I'm somewhere in the middle. But the churchy vibe, when you, when the joy you're talking about, when, pe when you see a whole crowd open up like that, it's what we need today. So I'm with you. I hope 2021 we can get back on stage in people's faces and actually congregate again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love you, man. Thank you for oh, your I love time. you too, James. And I really love how the God rays are coming in and washing <laughs> over you right now. It's pretty psychedelic. We did not plan this. <laughs> <laughs> love you, brother. Good luck, and I hope you make another record in 2021. Yes, sir. All, All right, right now. You. All right. Bye-bye.